Welcome to Sharon, everybody. Glory to God. Hey, turn to somebody you're sitting next to and say, I'm glad I found you here this morning. I'm glad I found you. <laughs> and you. Uh, glad I found you here this morning. <laughs> Very good. Very good. It's always good to come together and worship. We know that this is one of the one of the church families that people are worshiping with today, and we just thank God for all of them. The family of God is just all over the planet. It's, it's a beautiful thing to be part of that as our local church family gets together today. We are very happy to have you here if you are visiting with us. We would uh, love to come alongside of you as you walk your path in life. Uh, if you would like to know more about us or make a relationship, or even come sit with Pastor Jim sometime over a cup of coffee or a Snickers bar. Uh, <laughs> we invite you to fill out one of these Connect cards and offering plate when it comes by. We would love to get to know you. Some of you have been coming around for quite a long time, and we've never actually sat down and had a conversation. You know who you are because you've never sat down with me to have a conversation, so I invite you... <laughs> to consider contacting me this week and saying, what can we set up? Because I, I, I feel awkward when I see people now for month after month. I don't know their names, and I, it's embarrassing to me. Uh, it's really my fault, but I don't know how else to invite you to, to uh, engage with us this way. But it's an exciting day to worship. Uh, here are, are full of not only information about how this service is going to go, in the order of service, but we have the announcements for the week on the back. I need to lift up a few things that are happening this week. Uh, obviously, there are more things I'm going to be talking about on, on the list in your bulletin. Please study these. I invite you to do that. Tonight is trunk or treat. It is the one day of the week, or, or excuse me, uh, as a matter of fact, for the last three years in a row, we've had more interaction with our community at Trunk or Treat in our parking lot with our neighbors than we have had on Christmas Eve. Let that sink in. We will never have a chance, probably in the next 12 months, to interact with people who live in our neighborhoods, bringing their children to the church campus. So if you are just sitting around your house tonight between 5 and 6.30, you are missing an opportunity to rub and to have a glance with your neighbors. I invite all of y'all to come. It's not late at night. It's not after dark. It's 5 o'clock until 6.30. And you might even be able to get a piece of candy. <laughs> Do you hear what I'm saying, family? Yeah. They're yeah. coming here tonight. They won't be here tomorrow or the next day, unless perhaps they have an encounter with one of you who treats them with respect, who's friendly, who's welcoming. Don't stay home. Come. It's not going to be a sunny evening, but it's not going to be a rainy evening. And God's people will be gathering around to welcome our neighbors. 
set us up for something beautiful. All right, enough about that. On Friday, the men's group invites you to join them for a meal. It's free to you. All you have to do is come and perhaps bring a friend or a neighbor or somebody that needs to know that there's still people who are calm in this world who are able to just come and kick back and relax over a dinner of pulled pork and beans and dessert and all kinds of other beautiful things. Musical entertainment is going to be there. I don't know what I'm missing, David, other than there are sign-up sheets at either end on the table over here and a table outside in the hallway there. Kind of like to get some concept of how many people are going to come. And if you're bringing a friend, let us know about that too. You can call tomorrow and leave a message at the church as well. But it's a, it's a time to just relax. It's been kind of chaotic. Have you noticed? So this is a time to just unwind and exhale and be together and enjoy a meal, and then go home and vote. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I also would lift up that on Wednesday evening, the Taste of Sharon Supper is featuring a potluck style, or uh, whatever you bring is what we're having, I guess is what I'm saying. So Linda invites you to consider bringing one of your best dishes, maybe something out of the church book, uh, come and share a meal with your church family, but it is, it's for all of us, it's, it's uh, potluck style, or covered dish, I guess, is a more appropriate word for that. I don't know how else to say this other than this is going to be a, a church family comment from Pastor Jim to the congregation. There's a guy that's been part of this church family a lot longer than me. His name is Ken Haynes. Many of you know Ken. Many of you do not know Ken. But he has been living in an apartment down in uh, Sunset Beach, just kind of behind where the planetarium is. He is having difficulty getting outside, and he would like somebody to help him get some groceries. He can't go to the grocery store. He can tell you all about why. He has money, and he has a shopping list. He's left a message here at the church, and to tell you the honest truth, as soon as I leave here, Susie and I are gonna grab a quick lunch and go to Southport, where uh, I'm speaking at a Hispanic church today, and we're gonna come back and set up for trunk or treat. We're not gonna be able to help Ken today. I'm only gonna say this. I have written out his name and his phone number on these pieces of paper. And if we are who we say we are, at least one person is going to get up here, take one of these, and give Ken a call today. Otherwise, they're going to sit here, and I'll call him tomorrow. I'll put him over here so you don't have to get too far, but. All right. Actually, I don't think I want to go any further until somebody does that. <laughs> yeah. If more than one person calls, that's okay. Or if you see who's, uh, if you see who's taking those, maybe you can huddle together. Nope. Yeah, he's he's doing really well. He's got a nice apartment. He's had some independence. He just needs help getting some to his house. All right. In your bulletin is our prayer list for today. I invite you to uh, begin transferring your mind and your heart, your spirit toward prayer. Join us this week in praying for Benny Ludlam, Winky Evans, R.L. and Nancy Hewitt, Ann Kaysen, Dean and Pat Drawn, Bill Hughes, Ted Norton, Joni Raban, Raban, Roban, Roban, Joni Roban. All right. Larry Allen Evans, Michael Conley, Cindy Gibson, Christy Stokely, Jean Blake, 
Linda Register, Connie Willard, Derek Alwern, Debbie Norris, Archie and Beverly, Victoria Edge, Karen Wilson, Jill Maxwell, Joan Steinbeck, Steve Evans, Bill Inman, the survivors of recent floods. I don't know if anybody put anything on the list today in the hallway, but I haven't received, so I don't know. Uh, Are you asking for prayer? Okay, thank you, thank you. Yes, Connie is on the list. Also, Louise and Sonny Tanner. I think this says Larry Drapeck and Belinda Dixon. In the international Christian church family that we're lifting up, are the Christian brothers and sisters in Nigeria. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious God, it's good to be in your house today with our church family. We thank you for being our God, for being the object of our worship today. You have blessed us as a congregation. We have joy in our hearts. We have purpose for living. We have a mission as a church family, and we, we dedicate this time to you. Certainly you are a good God. Certainly you are a God who answers prayers. Certainly you are a God who heals. Certainly you are a God who provides. Certainly you are a God who does not hide from us. Certainly you are a God who saves us, who forgives us, who brings us back into relationship with you when we've gone astray. Certainly you are a God who understands who we are in our most inmost parts. So Lord, please, God, on behalf of those we've lifted up, and they're all requests for healing, whether it's physical healing from those floods or physical healing from disease long-term and short, physical healing that has to do with mental illness. We know that you are a healing God. We plead the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, over these hurting people, over these hurting families. And we love the way the church responds when we see people in need. I am so grateful, God, to all the press that's going to your glory of how churches have risen up to help those in need from recent storms in North Carolina, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. We're so happy that those news outlets that usually ignore the church are suddenly putting the word out <laughs> that churches are leading the way, partnering with agencies to help to restore, to recover, to put broken lives back together. This morning we ask your blessing on us the places where we work, the places where we go to school, the places where we eat in restaurants. We pray over the highways as truck drivers are delivering food and other goods for the railroad industry and the shipping industry. Any place people are trying to keep this world going. And of course, Lord, there's an election coming up and we ask for your perfect will to be done. There's just nothing more to be said about it, Lord, as we go to the polls. We want what you want, nothing more and nothing less. And help us as a congregation, as individuals, as families, and as a church family to accept whatever happens as we live into this world that you've called us to live into. You are Lord, you are King, you are Master, we are citizens of your good kingdom. Keep that right out in front of us, no matter what happens. We praise you, and we thank you for this nation that we live in, the freedom that we have, the opportunities that we have. We pray that we more and more would be a blessing because we've been blessed so much. 
And now, as your children, who you love so much, we before you, lifting up the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, Sharon. Could everybody stand as you're able? We're getting ready to worship the Lord in song. Nancy, R.L., Winky, it's good to see you. T-Mac, I see you back there. We got a good treat this morning. Henry Van Drill is on the organ with the praise band. Let's give him a hand. He's working with us, okay? All right. I thought he was coming to get me and lock me up. Okay. Here we go. We got Speak to the Mountains. Let's sing it up.
you for being who you are. And that's everything. Everything, God. Our prayer right now as a church is for each individual heart to open up right now and just soak in your love, your courage, your boldness, your wisdom, your son Jesus. Help us, Lord, in our daily things that we do as we go through the week to do those tasks and do them right. But as we do them, let us show Jesus to whoever may need him. We all need him. We all need him right here in this church this morning. Oh, Jesus, we love you, Jesus. You died on that cross for us. You did nothing wrong, but you died for our for the whole world, Lord. And we're grateful, thankful for that this morning. We pray for our little world in this universe. So many things are going wrong. A lot of it's due to the fact because you're not in it, Jesus. Man won't let you in it. They want to take God and the Lord out of everything. But not here. Not here at our church and other churches that ring out through the country and the world. But we pray for those people in the world because we know that you love them as much as you love us. So it's in our prayer this morning, Jesus. God, continue to work until you return on that white horse with a flame of fire in your eyes to keep your promise. In your name we pray, amen. 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 invite our friend Paulette Harlan to come up at this time or come down come right here and uh, she's got some things that she'd like to talk to the kids about so kids I invite you to come and Miss Paulette's going to share with you about a trip she's about to take and 
maybe some things that you can be involved with yourself. I'm going <laughs> to welcome you up here, and then I'm going to go sit with my wife. Beautiful, beautiful. Ready to go, and we are hoping that you guys will pray for us while we're gone. 
Take your time there, sister. <laughs> Pay no attention to what's happening over there. In fact, this is a good time to invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to give and receive our tithes and our offerings. God, we thank you for the blessings. We dedicate these tithes and offerings to the furthering of your kingdom. You've called us to do the work, but you've also blessed us with the resources to make it happen. To your glory. Amen. 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 Well, let's join together in saying what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hallelujah. Ah! Uh -huh. 
please be seated. Good morning. Our lecture reading this morning is from the very first psalm in the book. And it goes like this. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit on the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate, day and night. They are like trees, planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season. And their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like trap, chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. This is the word of God given to each of us as the children of God. Thanks be to God. Good advice in Psalm number one, right at the beginning. Happy. How many of you would like to experience happiness? Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. That doesn't seem very hard. <laughs> Happy are those who don't take the path 
that sinners take seems reasonable. And yet, it's hard. It's hard, because we live in a world that's broken, right? We live in a world that you know, the Bible itself refers to the world as fallen. Some people don't like to admit that. Some people push against that because they don't want to admit that this isn't all there is. According to Webster's Dictionary, I was interested in the word wicked because it gets used a lot, but I'm not sure everybody really understands what that means. Just the, just the dictionary, so forget about a Bible dictionary, just the American Family Dictionary from Webster's. Do we trust them? We used to. <laughs> it says, here's wicked, evil or morally bad, sinful. Even in Webster's Dictionary, it says sinful. Unjustifiable. Dreadful. Beastly. Ill-natured. Mean. Spiteful and foul. Does that sound like anything we ought to be involved with? Wickedness. I think the psalmist was right. Happy are those who stay away from all that. Now, if you haven't voted yet, <clears throat> or if you're still undecided, <laughs> maybe that'll be helpful to you. It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> who would Jesus vote for, right? That's the end of that part. Another help would be to consider the candidates, if you still are undecided, uh, candidates at all levels of the election, if you held them up based on what they tell you about themselves, what you, what you know about them, or at least what you think you know about them, hold them up to Jesus' master class, about human behavior and the way people are supposed to treat other people and what's important and what's not important. Hold them up to that standard. I'll just review this because this is a review part of a message that I'm giving that's part of that master class. We're getting to the end of the Sermon on the Mount study together where Jesus is asking people to pull it all together, all of the teaching, and live like that. Live like that. Don't just agree with it. Don't just give mental assent to it. Actually, live like that. Here's what Jesus says. This is what, I, I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus has said about how people who are his disciples should live among other people. Humbly. Disciples of Jesus are humble. They're hungry for righteousness and terribly sorry for their sin. They are repentant, merciful, pure, generous, walking in light and in darkness. They are not adulterous. They are honest. They're loving toward their enemies. They are not judgmental. They are prayerful. They are not prone to worrying, and they treat others the way he or she would want to be treated. I hope that helps you. You're welcome. Whatever that means to you. Whatever that means, because I'm finding that it means different things to different people, but it, it really shouldn't. <laughs> but we don't live in a world that's fair. So let's go on. Chapter 7 of the Sermon on the Mount, or at least of Matthew's Gospel account of the Sermon on the Mount, starts taking us in the direction of being doers of his word instead of just hearers of his word. How many of you know there's a big difference between hearing what we should be like and 
living how we should be living. Anybody? Yeah. Lucy, thank you. I set her up. I said, if nobody else, please say something. <laughs> Don't leave me hanging. Now, thank you to whoever's running the slides. You've been trying to get me to go, and I'm going to go. Matthew chapter 7. By the way, pray for me. I uh, have the honor and the privilege to speak at a, the Hispanic church in Omega. They're a non-denominational Pentecostal church that speaks Spanish. <laughs> a little delegation of us is going down there. Uh, Got to be there by 1 o'clock. So if you notice me not hanging out here after the service, it's because got to go. <laughs> got to go. But pray that the Holy Spirit would make whatever I say make sense to the people who are here. I do not speak Spanish. No habla espanol. That's all I have for him at the beginning is that. And praying for the translator, Consuelo, who is a lovely young Christian woman. All right, I'm going to read chapter 7, verses 13 through 23. It picks up right after the golden rule conversation that Jesus had during this conversation with his disciples. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. <laughs> and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. This sounds like a Dr. Seuss book. But this is what Jesus says. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That is not like a Dr. Seuss book. That's serious. I'm going to read that one again. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And thus you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, this is Jesus talking, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, he's talking about his second coming, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name or do many deeds of power in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. This is the gospel reading for us this morning. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would work in me now. I pray that those in the congregation who have ears to hear to let them hear from you, not from me. Those who have eyes, help them to see what you're up to. We need you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Amen. Here we have Jesus giving another one of those imperatives. Remember what imperatives are? They're commands. He doesn't say, maybe you ought to consider going through the narrow gate. He says, enter through. Enter through. Go in there. Go through the gate. On the other side of the gate is the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes we need to hear it said in just a little bit different way. Jesus says, do that. Go, please. 
go through the narrow gate. The road of life is hard. That's where it takes a turn. Like, okay, I'll go through the gate. I'll take the path of righteousness. And then Jesus says, but it's going to be hard. And we say, come on, why? Why? I thought you loved us, God. And the reality is, man, when I created this world, it was a paradise. When I gave Adam and Eve the keys to the kingdom, the gate was wide open. All they had to do was live the way I told them to live, and they wanted more. So the gate has been narrowed. The world has been under a curse. But God still is crazy about us. Not just people in the United States, but people around the whole world. God loves people. God created people to be in loving relationship. And that's good news. But it's a narrow gate. It's a, it's a narrow path to walk. Once you enter the gate, it's still hard. In 1976, my parents moved our family to a place called Panama, New York, a population 500. That's where I spent the rest of my childhood and right on through community college when I got married to Susie, I was still living there. Panama, New York is famous for something called Panama Rocks. It is a, an outcropping, it's called a scenic wonder. There's giant rock formations as high as this room. There's little caves and caverns and nooks and crannies and moss covered things and people come from all over the country to go to Panama Rocks. Depending on who you ask, those rocks were either 10,000 years old or 750 billion years old. I don't know. All I know is they were rocks. There's a picture over here that's not me or anybody I know in there, but there was a little crevice that had a sign on it. It was called Fat Man's Misery. <laughs> you can only imagine why it was called Fat Man's Misery. The idea was go through this narrow crevice and get to the other side where there's a nice little spot, a, a rock you can sit on and maybe even have lunch. But you can't get there unless you go through fat man's misery. And if you remember, in 1976, little Jimmy Pagan was a chubby little boy. Ten-year-old chubby boy. And I never, ever, ever once was able to get through fat man's misery. It made me very sad. We lived for, there for years, and I used to try and try and try and try. I tried to put butter on my front and on my back, and it didn't help. I tried holding my breath. That didn't help. I just couldn't get it. Both of my brothers, my older brother and my younger brother, were really skinny. They used to just run back and forth through there, and I was miserable and jealous because they could go through there, and I couldn't. It was sad. It was sad. I never went through fat man's misery. It was too narrow. I couldn't make it through. Some people could, but I couldn't. Hearing Jesus say that the gate to life is narrow and that few find it can seem demoralizing, can't it? It is demoralizing, and it can even seem frightening at face value. Like, gosh, what? It, it, it's hard to hear the Lord say that. The good news is that it's not a secret. Jesus wants us to walk through. And if Jesus wants us to walk through, guess what Jesus can do? He can open the door as wide as it needs to be. As wide as it needs to be for us. Because now we're not talking about doors and gates. We're talking about the way to the kingdom of God. The way to perfect relationship with our creator. The way of salvation 
for sinners. That's what we're talking about here. He wants us to walk the path to life. Is that so bad? He wants us to find the gate. And when we find the gate, even though it looks like we might not be able to get through, remember last week? Ask, seek, and knock, and the door will be open. This all ties together. Standing on the other side of the gate with the light off, wish go away. Jesus is sitting inside looking through whatever the window is. He looks through and says, are they coming? Will they come? Will they come? That's our Jesus. Now, here's the other thing about this gate and the path. Jesus himself, in other scriptures, in other parts of the gospel, says, not only should you take the gate, I am the gate. Not, not only should you walk on that path that's hard, I'm the way. I'm the way. I'm the way. It's me, you guys. It's me, he says. I'm the way. I'm the gate. Is it hard? Yeah. I'm going before you. I'm going before you to prepare a place for you on the other side. And I, lo I love you. I want you, I want to help you, I want to rescue you, I want to heal you, I want to raise you up. It's hard, we look back at the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, it's not easy to treat our enemies with love. It's not easy to take money that we want to buy stuff for ourselves for our own pleasure and give it to the Lord's work. It's not easy to forgive people who've wronged us. It's not easy to do a lot of the things that Jesus calls his disciples to do. But it's the good way. It's the best way. It's the best option that we have. Because those other ways, those other paths, do not lead to the place we desire to go. They do not lead to the place we were designed to go. We are to enter into the way that leads to eternal life and abundant life now. Verses 17 through 20 takes a little shift from entering into the gate and take the path of righteousness. It talks about different types of people secretly being referred to as trees. He's really talking about people. Did we figure that out, right? A good tree bears good fruit. What are the kinds of good fruit that a good life bears? Love, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, generosity, the kinds of things that Jesus just got done teaching the people. Good fruit. A good tree, also known as somebody who enters in through the narrow gate and is walking the path of righteousness, a good fruit is going to bear, or a good tree is going to bear good fruit. It can't bear anything else. Conversely, no matter how hard a bad tree wants to bear good fruit, the bad tree can't. No matter how, how badly a, a wicked person would love to actually be loved, we have not made the right choice for them to be able to bear that good fruit in their life because they have not entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ. A saving relationship where they confess their shortcomings, where they are forgiven their sins, where they are set free through the 
blood of Jesus Christ, who gave himself up. You know, the, Tony, when he said it's hard, he knows it's hard. He did it, right? <laughs> but on the other end, what did his father do? He lifted him up. He glorified him. He seated him on a throne. He gives that to us. No matter how badly a wicked person wants that, they're not going to till they humble themselves, turn from their wicked way, seize the face of God, and is transformed by the Holy Spirit. It's good news. It seems hard. How many of us understand that God's ways are not our ways? It's true. <laughs> How many of us understand that God's ways is the best way? And that God invites us to be on the way. That's what disciples do. It was said in the days of Jesus, not just about religious leaders, but other philosophical leaders, that the best disciples were covered with dust because they were walking so closely behind their masters. Did you hear that? The best disciples were covered with dust because they were walking so closely behind their masters. I love that imagery. Now the bad tree and the good tree, I think this was most likely a teaching about hypocrisy. Somebody who claimed to be something they were not. Somebody who was pretending. A fake disciple can get away with being a fake disciple for a while. They can fool some people some of the time but they cannot fool the Lord. And it's only the Lord that matters when it comes to accepting the fruit that we have to offer. Somebody else might be buying your bad fruit that looks good, but God's not buying it. Doesn't want it. As a matter of fact, it's going in the garbage no matter how good it looks, because it tastes sour. It's rotten. <laughs> people can see character flaws in other people, right? There's fruit inspectors out there. You've heard that term before. People that we encounter are fruit inspectors. I know there's fruit inspectors that are examining the way I live, and every once in a while somebody says basically, I just heard what you said. I just saw what you did. That was not good fruit. And I need people to hold me accountable sometimes. You need people to hold you accountable sometimes. Because that's how we get back on track. We wander off the path and we're led back through the power of God's Holy Spirit and through the love of our friends. Wolves in sheep's clothing. You know that that came from Jesus? That whole idea of wolves in sheep's clothing. Think Red Riding Hood, not in the Bible. But she's skipping away, trying to go to Grandma's house. She gets to Grandma's house. Little does she know that the big wolf has gone there first and has taken grandma and tied her up somewhere and <laughs> has put on grandma's sleeping cap. Little Red Riding Hood goes in there and like sees the wolf dressed in grandma's clothing. <laughs> grandma, what big eyes do you have? Grandma, what big teeth do you have? Right? People can spot a fake a phony, a hypocrite. Jesus was warning people against that. Jesus took to task the Pharisees, the religious leaders of his time. He's like, you guys look good, but you're like whitewashed tombs. Outside, you're all shiny and beautiful and clean, but on the inside, there's nothing but dead man's rotting bones. The more I study God's word, the more I see how it all works together. I love the word of God. The point is that God knows our hearts. Fake Christians are of no value to the kingdom of God. 
the invitation says, enter through the narrow gate. And the narrow path will squeeze us. We, go, we know that, right? It will squeeze us. It'll cost us something. It'll hurt sometimes. The alternative hurts worse and for way longer. <laughs> you know how much I love the expandable waist pant? There's no expandable gate for sinners. There's only repentant sinners who humble themselves and knock at the door and pray for God's mercy to open the door so they can be forgiven and enter in. Not that there's anything wrong with stretchy pants. I like those. But in the spiritual world, there's no stretching. There's grace until that moment of decision. This might be your moment of decision. Today may be the day where you actually say, you know what, I've kind of been playing around my whole life, never actually entered in. This will be a good day to do it. Would you pray with them, Tony, if they came forward? Take your wife with you in case you mess up. You, know, oh, you won't mess up. You wouldn't mess up because the Spirit of God will help you. Want to hear something sad? Jim Pagan's never been through fat man's misery. I never made it. I've never made it. I don't, I don't think I ever will. And it's okay. You know what else happened in that same year, 1976, when we moved to that new village? We also entered into a new church family, and that church family sent me to church camp. And at church camp, I heard about Jesus. I heard about the gospel. I heard about sin. I heard about repentance. I heard about salvation. I heard about an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I entered in there. I didn't enter in. I couldn't get through the gate at Panama Rocks, but I was invited to and responded to entering into the kingdom of God. And it's the best thing, right? A few years ago, when Susie and I were involved in leadership at that same camp as adults, they were tearing down the tabernacle where I bent my knee down and accepted Christ, and I, I saved a piece of the wood from the tabernacle, and I, I made it into a little image of the tabernacle that I keep in my office. You could not buy this from no matter what you offered me, unless it was about Snickers. The gate to real and eternal life is narrow and the way of Christ will squeeze us. Few will enter. We have to hear that. Few will enter. Have you entered? Do you know anybody else who's not walking on the right path, who's never entered? This would be hopefully a motivation for you to spend some time talking with them about what it means to you that you've entered or not. Jesus loves us. God loves us. No matter how narrow the way, God always gives us enough grace to walk the way we need to. And when we get off course a little bit, he drags us back and puts us in place hand in hand with people like you who love each other and who have each other's backs. That's what it, it's all about. Jesus was calling his disciples into a relationship with each other and with him and with the good word of the gospel. Let's pray. God, we're grateful that you love us enough to invite us to enter into life eternal and abundant. Thank you for the stories that we have of how we heard your call, we heard your invitation, and we answered it with a yes. I pray for anybody here today that has never actually entered in because they've maybe been deceived into thinking they're doing okay without coming to you. 
or perhaps they don't think they're worthy of entering. They didn't know they were invited. Lord, speak to them by your spirit and help them understand everybody's invited, no matter what. Because you have torn the veil and made heaven available to us. We love you so much, God. Thank you for loving us. Amen. Our final hymn of the morning is Grace Greater Than Our Sin, number 365, if you're singing from the hymnal. If you can, please stand and let us worship the Lord with this singing. I see you tonight. They're even serving hot dogs. Oh, hey, Don is yeah. here. You are uh, okay. I uh, would like to take this opportunity to present to you and Susie a token of our appreciation for all you have done for us this year, all that we know you're going to be doing for us next year. Please take this this gift of love. 
Thank you. All right. Yeah. Yeah. We, we thought that was over. Y'all have been blessing us all month, and so uh, we humbly say thank you. You know. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how to segue back. Thank you. Um, there's hot dogs for you if you come. They might have to go buy some more if you all show up, but the little kids will be here. Um, it is a good thing to be walking with Jesus. It's a really good thing to be walking with Jesus together. Uh, it's a beautiful. I would say those of you who took Ken's phone number might want to get together down here. I'm going to say Joe and Brian maybe because they know what's going on. Uh, before, if you don't know, you might be beneficial. It might be beneficial for you to have a conversation today. He's asking for help. Oh, go in the grace of God. Walk in that path that's hard, and yet Jesus says, <laughs> put your yoke on my back, and I will carry you because my way is easy. <laughs> go with God. Go with the Father and of the Son, and go with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Oh. <laughs>